All right, what's going on everybody? In this video, we're gonna be doing some Algebra 1 final review. Now I know the finals are right around the corner and so I wanted to get this video out as soon as I could. In this video, we'll be doing 25 practice problems to help get you ready for your final. And in the next video, in the part two video, we'll be doing another 25 practice problems for a total of 50. Now, before I get into the different topics that we're gonna be doing practice problems for in this video, I wanted to quickly make sure that you are subscribed to this channel. Of course, you know, while you may be in Algebra 1 right now, you're also going to have to take, you know, Geometry and maybe you'll have to take Algebra 2 and up through your high, high school mathematics courses as well and maybe into college taking some math courses as well. So. I definitely want to make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out the content that I have for those courses. I really hope that it could help you out. And uh, yeah, so anyways, let's dive in to the different topics that we're going to be covering in this video. All right, so in this video, in the part one video, we are going to be starting off talking about linear expressions and equations. Okay, so we're starting off small there. And then we're going to build our way up to talking about inequalities and absolute value equations. Okay, and then we will be talking about just functions. So this is going to be kind of the intro function stuff. Okay, kind of like just plugging into functions, things like that. Then we'll be talking about transformations of functions. Okay, so how to transform a function, different transformations that you can do, different things like that. Okay, then we'll be moving on to certain properties of functions. We'll be talking about, you know, domain and range quite a bit. Okay, we'll be doing some problems with lines, just, you know, linear functions. We'll be, I'll, I'll sneak in a couple dimensional analysis problems in there. So dimensional analysis, for those of you that aren't familiar, that's just unit conversion. Okay, I actually didn't know that until like the first semester of my, um, of my uh, freshman year in college. So <laughs> uh, anyways, exponential functions is the next topic that we will we will cover that's in the purple section and then the last section we will cover sequences okay so we've got a lot to cover so let's get started and by the way I do have all the timestamps on the left there in case there's a specific topic that you're definitely struggling with more than the others so you can go jump right to that uh, topic if you want so getting right into our first problem on the first topic linear expressions and equations so we're being asked if a is 2x squared plus 5 and B is negative 3x plus 2 then what's 2a minus B okay so to figure this out right what's 2a minus B okay you just have to plug in okay you know what a is okay that's a and then you know what B is okay so 2a minus B is just going to be equal to 2 times okay well here's what a is so it's 2x squared plus 5, right? And then we're just going to subtract what we know that b is, right? We know b is right here. So we're going to subtract that. And then it's just subtracting polynomials, okay? So we need, we need to know that when we're subtracting polynomials, and actually, before we get into that, we have to distribute this too. So let's distribute this too. we got to multiply it here and then multiply it here. So we're going to get the 2a minus b equals 4x squared, right? That's the 2 times 2x squared. And then the 2 times 5 is 10, so we have a plus 10 here, okay? Now that is minus a negative 3x plus 2. And what we can do here, since we're subtracting two polynomials, we can make this positive, okay, and distribute that negative. So this becomes positive, and this 2 becomes negative, okay? Now that we have that, we can kind of just get rid of the parentheses here. And we get 4x squared plus 10 plus 3x minus 2. Okay? And so now that we have that, what we can do is just simplify. Okay? Because we have like terms here. We have a 10 and a negative 2. Okay? So our final answer ends up being 4x squared plus 3x, and then we have 10 minus 2, which is 8. So 4x squared plus 3x plus 8. Okay, and that does it for our first problem. Now, I, I didn't mention this 
previously, uh, I completely forgot to make sure that you try these problems on your own. Okay, that that's how this video will help you most. If you if you look at the the question, you know, pause the video quick, try the problem on your own first, and then see if you get the answer right. Okay, and of course I'll be going through it with you, so there's no worries if you get the answer wrong. You know, it'll just help you learn a lot better to try it first, and then I'll explain it. Okay, so I do recommend when I get to the next question, pause the video, and then try it on your own. Okay, so for our next problem, for problem two, we want to solve for y, where x equals two thirds times y plus five halves. Okay, so we just got to get y by itself. And the big thing, listen, I know that when I was in algebra one, this is exactly what was going through my head. I would have been immediately scared by these fractions. Okay, just don't be. All right, fractions, not a big deal. Okay, they work just the same as if you had, you know, like a two times y plus five, right? It's still going to work the exact same way. Okay, the reason why people don't like fractions is because now there's you know, some extra steps like maybe finding common denominators if you're subtracting two fractions and then, you know, it, it just, it can get a little more messy sometimes, but you know, it's again, nothing to be worried about. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna do here Okay, we could, since we're solving for this y, there's, I mean, a couple things that we could do here, but I recommend dividing by two thirds on both sides. Okay, if we do that, this two thirds just goes away, right? Because two thirds divided by two thirds is one. So if we divide by two thirds on this side, remember, if we're dividing two, frac or if we're dividing two fractions, so we have x over one divided by two over three, right? Well, then we can just do stay change flip, right? And that's, you might know it as keep change change or something like that, right? We're gonna change the sign here to a multiplication symbol and we're gonna flip this fraction. So we have a three over two, okay? So we're gonna get here three X over two, all right? So if you can follow that, then I think we're well on this way, well on our way to getting this problem done. Okay, because this is all we have left now. Okay, and all we have to do to completely solve this problem is just subtract five halves on both sides. Okay, the reason why we do that is because, well, five halves is being added here, we do the opposite, we subtract, right? And that makes it zero. So when this goes away, okay, this goes to zero and then we have our answer, right? We have Y by itself, that's our, that's our job. So we get Y equal to, 3x over 2 minus 5 halves. And that's the answer. Okay? Moving on to problem 3. Okay? We want to solve for x here. And we have negative 3 times the quantity 1 minus 2x equals 9x plus 1. Okay? So the first thing here is I'm gonna distribute this negative three, okay? It doesn't work the same as in the last problem where we could just divide two thirds over. It doesn't really have a benefit because there is an X term on this side, okay? If there was a Y term on this side, I wouldn't have recommended it because it doesn't really help us, okay? So if we distribute this negative three through, we get a negative three plus six X equals nine X plus one, okay? Now all that's left to do is get all the X's on one side and everything else on the other. What we can do here, and I what I recommend doing, is subtracting 6X on both sides. Okay, well, we'll just get the X's on one side to start off. Okay, we do that, so we, we get zero on that side. Um, so we are just left with a negative three. And then we have a nine X minus six X, which is three X, okay? And then we have that plus one that'll come down, okay? So the only thing left to do, well, the, there's two things left to do, but we have to get this minus one over on the, or the plus one over on the other side, okay? Because we have to isolate X now. So that's the only thing left to do is isolate X. That's what I meant to say. You isolate X by just subtracting one on both sides. You get that, and I'll write this backwards now. I'll say three X equals negative four, okay? And because that's, you know, negative three minus one is negative four. And then I'm going to divide three on both sides. Okay. And there you see that X equals four thirds. All right. 
Now moving on to our next section. This is the orange section now. We're on inequalities and absolute value equations. Okay. Now our que the question here is B is asking us to solve for x. Okay. And we have the the we have the inequality here. Uh, three fourths times x minus two is less than two times the quantity four x plus five. Okay. So the first thing to do here is going to be to distribute. If we distribute and then just combine, like get our x's to one side and all our constant values, all our things without x's to the other, and we isolate x, that's it. We've solved our problem. Okay? So that's really the process that we're going to follow here. Okay? Again, so I can say it again and make sure this is all going through. Okay? We're going to distribute, then we're going to get x, all the x's on one side and everything else on the other. And then we're just going to isolate x because we'll have something at this point, we'll have something like maybe 10 x. We divide by 10 on both sides. We have x completely by itself. Okay? Let me show you. So remember that first step that I said was distribute. Okay? Normally, if you have any distributions to do, you take care of that first. So we'll distribute this 3 fourths to the x and distribute it to the negative 2. 3 fourths x minus a. 2 times 3 over 4 is going to give us 6 over 4, right? Which we can actually rewrite. We can simplify that. That's just 3 halves. Okay? And uh, how do I do that? If that didn't click right away, you just divide by 2 over 2. And that is uh, 3. Uh, you, you, yes, you divide by 3 over, uh, yes, it's 3 halves. <laughs> okay, so that's the idea. So now you can distribute on the right side and you get two times four X and two times five. Okay. So here you now get eight X plus 10. All right. So now what you can do is subtract three fourths X on this side and on this side. Okay. Because now the step that we're following is to get all x's to one side, everything else to the other side. Okay, that's kind of like step two, and that's a long step to write, but I'm not really sure, at the moment, I'm not sure how to compact that down yet. Okay, so now we have to do an eight minus three over four. Okay, that's kind of where, where fractions can get a little messy. So let's do that out. We have a eight minus three over four. We can rewrite that as if we get common denominators here, we get a common denominator of four. We would have to multiply eight by four over four. Okay, so it needs to be eight times four over four, which would give us 32 over four. So we end up getting 32 over four minus three over four, and that is 29 over four. Okay, so, okay, I'll actually leave that up for a second so you can copy that down. Okay, now we have 29 over 4x, right, because that was 8x minus 3 over 4x. Okay, and then we bring down the plus 10. Okay, so now, remember, we got all our x's to one side, so we did the first part, but we need to get everything else to the other side, and that everything else that I'm talking about is the 10. So how we're going to do that is by subtracting 10 on both sides. Okay. And when we subtract 10 on both sides, that's going to be another fraction problem. Okay. So we need to do negative 10 minus three halves. Okay. And what we have to do is basically just get common denominators again. So we get that this is negative 20 over two, right? The negative 10 is uh, when we just multiply by two over two, we subtract by three over two and we get negative 23 over 2. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense, right? We just we just multiply negative 10 by 2 over 2, and we get negative 20 over 2, and that replaces negative 10. Okay. So, negative 23 over 2. That's going to go on this side, and this is now less than 29 over 4x. Okay, 
Now, the last step, the step that the last step that I mentioned was to isolate x, right? Because now we just have something being multiplied by x, so we have to divide it. Okay, now you see some really gross division here, but actually it turns out not being terrible because all you have to do is do, so do right here, negative 23 divided by two divided by 29 over four, okay? And you flip this, this becomes a multiplication sign and you flip this, so you get four over 29, okay? And so you get, well, this can become a two, this can become a one, okay? and you have negative 46 over 29, okay? So just a little bit of, you know, kind of uh, a little bit of mental math there. I mean, you can do it out if, if that doesn't click with you as fast. I know it does not click that fast uh, with everybody. Of course, I've been doing math much longer than you have, okay? So there may be certain things that click right for me that I don't realize haven't clicked for you yet. So I apologize if that's the case. But yeah, negative 23 times two is negative 46, okay? So that is going to be uh, our answer. So we get that negative 46 over 29 is less than x, okay? Or And you can also rewrite that as x is greater than negative 46 over 29. Okay, it's saying the same thing. Okay, and you cannot simplify that because 29, I believe, is a prime number. Uh, you can't put three into it, so yeah, it's probably a prime number. Um, yeah, yes it is, okay, good. So, moving on to our next problem. We have negative two times x plus three is less than or equal to negative seven x, okay? now. There are a couple of different ways that we could solve this. I mean, the first thing we we could maybe do something other than distribution. We could maybe divide that negative two on both sides. I don't really see. I mean, it wouldn't really help us in this case. I don't. I don't think it would make anything any quicker. But if we did divide on both sides by a negative number, if we multiply on both sides by a negative number, well, remember we need to flip the sign of the inequality. Okay. Let me show you why. Because maybe you don't know. And I definitely don't think that that was something that I just knew intuitively as uh, an Algebra 1 student. Okay, so let me show you. If you have something like, I actually had an example written down here that I used earlier. I had the example negative 2 is less than 1. If you multiply each side by negative 2, you get that 4 is less than negative 2. But wait a second, 4 isn't less than negative 2, 4 is greater than negative 2, right? So how does that make sense? Well, basically what you have to do, you know, when you ever you multiply or divide by a negative number is you flip the sign, okay? And that makes a statement true again, all right? So you flip the sign, make it 4 is greater than negative two, and now you have a correct statement, okay? So that happens whenever you are multiplying or dividing by a negative number, okay? So I'll give you a couple seconds there to write that down if you want to, and now I'm deleting. So. Let's distribute this negative two, okay? So let's not go through that hassle now that I've explained it. All right, and we'll get a negative two x, negative two times three is a negative six, okay? And that's less than or equal to negative seven x, okay? So now, what I wanna do is, and I like dealing with positive values, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to add seven x on both sides because that's gonna give me a positive five x. Okay, so well, this will go away. Okay, and this becomes 5x. And so I get 5x minus 6 is less than or equal to 0. Okay, so now I have a positive 5x, so not like a negative 5x like I would have had, or actually it would have been a negative 9x if I would have, a sub, or, no, sorry, it would have been a negative 5x, sorry, because if I would have, I could have added 2x on both sides and you know that would have been equally as fine, but then I would have had a negative and I don't like dealing with negatives. 
Okay, so the next thing to do is to add six to both sides. Okay, this goes away. You have five X is less than or equal to six. And then you divide by five on both sides. And you get X is less than or equal to six over five. Okay, so moving on to number six, we want to solve for X where we have the absolute value of 6x minus 2 equals 10. Okay, now how do we deal with absolute values? Okay, well, it actually makes sense how we deal with absolute values if you just understand the full concept of what's going on. Okay, so let me explain that to you and then it'll make sense why we do what we do when dealing with absolute values. Okay, so the thing about absolute values is that this quantity right here could be negative 10, right? Let's say that 6x minus 2, let's say we had some x to where this thing came out to be negative 10, okay? We'd have the absolute value of negative 10 is equal to 10. And we know that's true because the absolute value of negative 10 is 10. So this equation is true, okay? And of course, the same could also apply if we just had that this quantity, instead of being negative 10, it was 10. Okay, if it's just 10, well then we have the absolute value of 10 equals 10 and that doesn't really change anything. It's still 10 equals 10. So the idea is that now we have two solutions because of that absolute value. So that 6x minus 2 could be equal to negative 10 and it could also be equal to 10. Okay, because the absolute value, remember what an absolute value does. It makes anything in it positive. Okay, so it'll make that quantity negative 10 positive. So it'll become 10, all right? So that's the idea. So what do we do to work with this? Well, we do 6x minus 2 equals 10, and 6x minus 2 equals negative 10, okay? And we solve both of these equations. So let's solve the one on the left first. We'll add two on both sides. So we get this goes away. This is 6x minus, or sorry, 6x equals 12. And then we divide by 6 on both sides. And we get x is equal to 6. So that is our first solution of x. But now we have another one. Okay. So we'll add 2 on both sides, right? And the reason, you know, hopefully I'm not going too fast with these equations, but the reason why we're adding 2 here is because it's being subtracted. Right, so we do the opposite. These cancel out, and we have 6x equals negative 8. Dividing by 6 on both sides, we get x is equal to negative 8 over 6. You can simplify that by dividing by 2 on the top and bottom, and you get negative 4 over 3. So x is equal to 6, and x is also equal to negative 4 over 3. And I apologize. Sorry, guys. I know you've probably seen this uh, yet. 12 divided by 6 is not 6, it is 2. So I apologize for that. Anyways, moving on to uh, problem 7. Okay, now, uh, you know, this might be the first time you're watching one of my uh, videos, but what I recommend is that, you know, when I get through two colored sections, uh, take a break and you know take like a five minute break and come back to the video so you're not going to get burnt out you know you're not going to get really uh, like sick of studying or anything like that okay so i do recommend right now take a five minute break just take a you know quick five minute break come back to the video i'll still be here it's all right um but it's just going to help you get through this entire thing okay that's actually how i study for college i use something called the pomodoro technique it's definitely something you should look up it's really cool Okay, assuming that you've taken that five minute break, let's jump back in to uh, our yellow section here on functions. Okay, so for this section on functions, our first problem is we're given f of x is 3x cubed minus 2x squared plus x minus 5. And we're asked to find f of 2, f of 0, and f of negative 1. Okay, so First off, what is this? What's f of two? What's f of zero? Like, what what is this notation actually telling us? All it's saying, you know, usually it's f of x, but when we have a number there, it just means that we're plugging in two for x. All right. 
So not a big deal there. Okay, if we have f of two, we're trying to find out what the value is for f of two. We're just gonna plug in a two everywhere we see an x. So we get three times two cubed, minus two times two squared, plus two, minus five, right? So we just plugged in a two everywhere we saw an x, right? Right here, right here, and right here. All right, now we're just gonna simplify this, okay? We know that two cubed, hopefully you know by now that's eight, all right? And eight times three is 24, okay? Two squared is four, and you multiply that by two, and you get eight. Then you have a plus two and a minus five, okay? Now 24 minus eight is 16. 16 plus two is 18. 18 minus five is 13. So we get that f of two is equal to 13. All right, moving on, we have to find f of zero. And actually f of zero is really nice, okay? What happens with f of zero, well you plug in a zero for x and this goes away, this goes away and this goes away because, well, you're plugging in zero. So all three of these terms have x's in them, so they all go away and you end up getting that f of zero is just negative five but I'll show it out. You have three times zero cubed minus two times zero squared plus zero minus five, okay? You can see that here, this goes away, this goes away, this goes away, you just have negative five, okay? Lastly, we're gonna be doing f of negative one. So we just plug in a negative one, okay? Not, not a big deal that it's negative, doesn't change anything. We still do the exact same process, okay? Now, negative one cubed, whenever you have a negative to an odd power, that means that it is going to stay negative, okay? So you have now a, you'll get a negative one out of this, right? Negative one cubed is negative one. And so multiplied by three, that is a negative three. Then you're going to have a negative one squared, which gives you positive one, so you just have a minus two here because there were, this was already minus to begin with. Then you're gonna subtract one and subtract five. Okay, three minus two, or negative three minus two is negative five. Minus one is negative six. Minus five is negative 11. Okay, so your final answer is that f of two is 13, f of zero is negative five, and f of negative one is negative 11, okay? Now for problem eight, we are being asked which two equations intersect at the point negative one comma two, okay? Now we have our equations uh, listed in, in four choices, okay? So how do we do a problem like this? How do we see if equations are going to intersect at this certain point? Well, all we have to actually do is just plug in that point and hope that it's true for one of those, for, one of those choices, each choice is two equations. So if it's true, if that point makes the equation true, in other words, both sides are equal to each other, okay? And that happens in both the equations in that certain choice, then we know that choice is the answer, right? Those equations will intersect, okay? For instance, it might be better to give you a visual here. If this equation works with this point, meaning that we plug in a negative one for X and a two for Y, and this equation is true, we get something like negative four equals negative four. That's not what it's gonna be, but still. Let's say that, that those two sides equal each other. And let's say that that also happens for this equation, this y equals two to the x. Well, we know that these things are gonna intersect because if these equations are true with those points, that means that that, that graph, the graph of these two equations will pass through negative one, two, okay? Negative one, two will be a point on these, uh, the graphs of these equations, okay? So let's, if, assuming that makes sense, we'll start off with A. And A says that, well, we have a Y equals X plus three, okay? And we plug in a negative one and a two. So a negative one for X and a two for Y. Remember, this is X and Y. So for x, we plug in a negative one, and for y, we have a two, so we have a two equals negative one plus three, 
okay? And we get that two equals negative one plus three is two, so that works, okay? So we got one down. Let's see if it also works with y equals two to the x. And you'll see here that when we plug in a two for y and a negative one for x, two is not equal to two to the negative one. Because two to the negative one is one over two to the positive one, which is one half. Okay, so those two things are not equal, and so A is not the correct answer. Moving on to B. We have Y equals X minus one, and Y equals two to the X, or two times X, rather. And our point, remember, is negative one, two. Okay, so plugging in, we get that we have a two equal to negative one minus one, and already we can see that this isn't going to work. We have 2 equals negative 2. It does not. So B will not work. Okay? We don't even need to try this equation. Okay? Lastly, since I'm running out of room here, we are going to erase this. So hopefully you have that down. And we're going to work on C. For C, we can write down our two equations. And our point. Okay, and we just have to plug into the first equation here, like we've been doing. Plug in a two for y and a negative one for x. And so we will end up getting two equal to negative one squared is one. A negative three minus, uh, or negative three times negative one is positive three. And then we have minus two. Okay, and one plus three is four minus two is two. So this actually does equal two and that makes the equation true. Okay, so we have one down. Hopefully this one will actually work so we don't have to do uh, D. <laughs> so we can plug in here. Okay, two for Y, negative one for X. And we get two is equal to negative four plus six. And so two does equal two and this equation, this point works for both of these equations. So. C, uh, the two equations in C will intersect at negative one comma two, okay? It's a point that, uh, that, that both of those graphs pass through, okay? Because the equations are true when you plug in those points. So since both the graphs, uh, both the equations pass through that point, they are going to, they would have to intersect, right? That's what that means. If they both pass through that point, that means they intersect at that point, right? They cross paths. Okay, so C is going to be your answer here. All right, and so moving on to problem nine. Okay, problem nine asks, which point is not on the graph 3y plus 2 equals x squared minus 5x plus 17? Okay, so all we have to do here is just plug in again, right? If we're trying to see which point is not on the graph, we just want to see what point does not work with this formula, okay? If there's a point that doesn't work, that means, well, that point doesn't exist on that graph, right? That graph does not pass through that point, all right? So let's try with negative 2, 10. Plugging in a negative 2 for x and a 10 for y. Again, it, it doesn't matter that you have, uh, you know, not like y equals blank blankety blank blank x okay that's not a big deal uh, you can still plug in and if the left side is equal to the right side then you know that the point is on the graph if not then it's not plugging in a negative 2 for x and a 10 for y we get 3 times 10 plus 2 equals a negative 2 squared minus 5 times negative 2 plus 17 okay and multiplying out, we have three times 10 is 30 plus two is 32. We have negative two squared is four. Negative five times negative two is 10. And then we have plus 17. Now four plus 10 is 14. If you add 17 to that, you get 31. Okay, so you get 32 is equal to 31, but that's not true, right? So we know that A is actually gonna be our answer here. Okay, A is going to be, and I'll circle that in yellow because we're on the yellow section. A is going to be our answer because it does not work. So it's not on the graph. Okay, and if, I'll show you that it actually does work. If you, if you plug in 
let's plug in two and three, okay, for, for B. If you plug in that, you plug in a three for Y and a two for X, you get nine plus two equals four minus 10 plus 17, and so you get 11 equals four minus 10 is negative six plus 17 is 11, so this does work. Okay, and you'll see that it also works for C and D, but it does not work for A. So it's always a good check. Like, let's say that you have extra time on a final. Okay, this would definitely be a, a good problem to check, right? Make sure that your answer is correct. I mean, it may be a little sus suspicious because the first one that you did ended up being your answer, right? So you can, you know, you can check the other answers and see, okay, well, did this equation work for, for the other one, the other ones? Okay. You might see that you missed something like, uh, maybe, maybe you thought that it said, which point is on the graph where as it actually said, which point is not on the graph. So, and, and that's definitely something like that has definitely happened to me before. So I definitely know that it could happen to, to most of you as well, as well. Right. Although you, you guys might not be as gullible as I was, but anyways, Moving on to our next section on the transformations of functions, okay? Now, we want to, for problem 10, state the transformations done to the function y equals x cubed to obtain the function y equals two times x minus one quantity cubed plus seven, okay? So there's a couple different things that make this thing different than y equals x cubed, okay? The first thing is that this x is being subtracted by one. Now, what does that correlate to in, in terms of a transformation? And by the way, that is the first thing that we wanna write down because it's the innermost thing that's being applied to X, right? X, according to PEMDAS, right? We do what's inside the parentheses first. And that minus one is in with the X in the parentheses, okay? So basically what that ends up doing, right? Is since one is being subtracted, we switch the sign. So that is going to correspond to a, a shift right. Okay, it's gonna shift the entire graph of, of y equals x cubed, it's gonna shift it right by one. Okay, so shift right one unit. Okay, and just so you know, anything inside there corresponds to a left and right shift, okay? Anything outside, which is the next thing that gets uh, worked on, right? We have multiplication and division, right? And that two is a multiplication. That corresponds to a vertical stretch, okay? If it was uh, like a one half or something like that, or like a fraction that was less than one, then it would be a vertical shrink, okay? So how we write this is a vertical stretch because it's greater than one. And whatever that is, we just say it's by a factor of that number. So it's by a factor of two, okay? Meaning everything, every Y coordinate is going to be stretched by a factor of two, okay? And the last thing, we have to take care of our addition and subtraction. And what does that is the y-intercept, right? That will do the up-down shifting, right? It, it does the same exact thing for, for lines, right? It does the same exact thing for, for lines where if you change a y-intercept, you'll just shift the line up and down, okay? That's it. So what you have now is a you shift up seven units. Okay, and that all together is your answer. So just remember that when talking about transformations, you know, you have inside the parentheses, that's a left and right shift. You have your vertical stretches, your vertical shrinks, you know, and then you have your Y intercept, which controls up and down. Okay, you also could have like a negative out front here. And what that would correspond to is a reflection uh, over the X axis. Okay, and you could also reflect over the Y axis if your X's alone were negative. Okay, so there's a couple different things that could happen there. And if you feel like you're struggling with transformations by the end of the section, you should definitely look into that a little bit more. Okay.
So for problem 11, we want to find the equation of y equals x squared after it has been shifted left by 4 and up by 2. Okay, so we know that if we're shifting left by 4, that means that we need to, well, since it's y equals x squared, what we do is we can take this square away for a second, and we're going to put in some parentheses. Okay, since it's left by 4, we're going to add 4, right? We switch the sign, just like we did up here, right? So since it was minus 1, this was a shift right by 1. Okay, and then we're going up by two. That just corresponds to the y-intercept, the thing that sticks outside by itself. And so that's a positive two. We don't switch the sign for the y-intercept. Okay, we only switch the sign for the thing inside the parentheses. Okay, and actually that's just your answer. Okay, so this graph, the graph of this thing, is literally just y equals x squared shifted right a little bit and up a little bit. Okay, so kind of interesting there. Okay, so now that we are on to, we've, we've done another two sections, we did our yellow and our green section, so now we're on to, I, I guess I can call this aqua, maybe people get mad, so I'll call it cyan, I don't know, <laughs> but we'll have the aqua section and the blue section next, okay, so, you know, take another five minute break, and then come back to the video. We'll do our aqua and blue sections, which is properties of functions. And I actually forget what the next one is. Um, uh, I guess it'll be a surprise. All right, but anyways, yeah. So take a five minute break. Okay, assuming that you've done that, let's hop back in to our next section, which is uh, properties of functions. And we are doing problem 12. So we wanna find the domain expressed in interval notation of the function g of x graph below. And this thing is g of x, I forgot to label it. This is g of x. Okay, now, what is interval notation? Well, interval notation basically means that we have brackets to, and we have, and we have parentheses, right? Those are the two main components of interval notation. When you have, and, and, and an example of that is something like two, seven. Okay, so this is some interval, right? This is some period. So let's say that you have a graph that is defined from x equals 2 to x equals 7. Okay, and you have a closed circle here, and you have an open circle here. Okay, so this graph is defined from x equals 2, including 2, and x equals 7, not including 7 because there's an open circle here, right? So there's no actual point there. Okay, and Maybe I should take a step back if that went a little too fast for you. Okay, because the idea here is that we're finding the domain, okay? Which means what? Okay, you should be able to tell me what the domain is. The domain is all of the values of x that are defined for the function, meaning they have y, y coordinates, okay? So which are those for this function. Well, if we assume that this just goes over by ones, like this, that each box uh, in this graph is one by one, which is what you should assume if there aren't any tick marks, okay? If we go over on the x-axis, one, two, three, four, until the graph stops, right? Which it stops at this x point, Okay, you can see that there's an open circle here. So there's no actual point here, but there are points leading up to this point. Okay, so this is at negative four. So what we do is we just don't include it. We have negative four there. Okay, then we go over to our maximum x, which is over here. Okay, and you can see that this is a closed circle, right? This is a closed circle. So we're including that endpoint. And we go just like that. Okay, and we use a bracket because we're including it. So right there is our domain in interval notation. Okay, moving on to problem 13. If we restrict the domain of the function h of x equals the quantity x plus one squared plus one to negative two and two, including both endpoints, uh, which is you know what the brackets mean again. What is the new range of the function? Okay, so 
this is actually a really interesting problem and I definitely recommend that you try it on your own if you are feeling up for a challenge, okay? I'm not sure if this would be, uh, if something this difficult would be assigned on your actual final, okay? I guess it depends what kind of teacher you have or, you know, maybe what state you're in if you're in the United States, you know, different states have different uh, tests. But anyways, so how do you actually get started with this problem? Well, there's actually a really nice way to, okay? If you can recognize that this parabola is in vertex form, okay? Meaning that it's in that form after you complete the square, you'll get something like this, okay? That's called vertex form. You actually might start to realize something. If you graph this parabola, okay? There's a couple things that, that you'll notice, okay? And let's get some graphing paper here so I can show you what I mean. Okay, you can you can just sketch out a rough idea of what this parabola looks like. If I go like this, and I go like this, okay, I can sketch out a graph of what this parabola looks like because I know the vertex. Okay, the vertex means that point where uh, it turns around from either decreasing to increasing or increasing to decreasing. Okay, so the slope here, remember in vertex form, okay, I'll, I'll just write what vertex form is. You have y equals a times x minus h quantity squared plus k. That's what vertex form is, you should know that. Okay, that's definitely something you wanna know. But here we can see that we just negate this and we get our, our sorry, I'll back up for a second, sorry. I think I'm going a little too fast. The vertex is h comma k. There we go. Okay, I want to state that first. So to find the vertex, okay, we need to, well, if this is minus, okay, this is is plus. So what actually ends up happening here is our vertex is going to be h here is negative 1. Because if we have, and this is something that I think a lot of students struggle with, is realizing that this vertex is negative one comma one because k here is one but h here is actually negative one okay because to get into this form x minus h right if your h is negative one then you have something like x minus a negative one squared which gives you x plus one squared if you said that your h was one well then if you plug into vertex form you get x minus a positive one. And that's not what we have. We don't have x minus one, we have x plus one. So you have to realize that. Your vertex is negative one comma one, okay? So that's something to realize. Now, if you go to negative one, you go up one. This is the vertex of your parabola. This is the turning point, okay? And you can also see, you can sketch out a rough design of what this parabola is gonna look like because you know that this is a upward facing parabola. It's, it opens upward. You know that because if you, distrib if, if you distribute this out, right, you distribute out this x plus one squared and you add one to it, okay? You get a, well, first off, x plus one times x plus one. You have the plus one on the outside, right? That's what x plus one squared means. You can FOIL here, right? So you have x times x x times one, so you get x squared plus x, and then you have a one times x and a one times one. So you have plus x plus one, okay? And then you have x squared plus two x plus one. All right, and uh, since we already had that, that plus one on the end, I forgot to bring that down. So this actually becomes x squared plus two x plus two, okay? Now here's the idea, this x squared the, the coefficient on x squared will determine whether this thing is upward opening or downward opening, okay? If this is positive, it's upward opening. If it's negative, it's downward opening. To prove that, consider y equals x squared. It looks like this, right? But y equals negative x squared, when you make that negative, it goes like this, right? And from your knowledge on transformations of functions, you should realize that this is a reflection about the x-axis. So whenever you see a negative here, it's a reflection about the x-axis and you get that your parabola is going to open up downwards, okay? So all this is really interesting stuff that you should start to put together.
okay? Because what this means, since we have an upward facing parabola, we can realize something. When we restrict this range, okay, and I will just get rid of this for now. When we restrict this range to, and actually, sorry, sorry, I'm gonna go back on that. I wanna keep this, because we're gonna need that. Okay, and actually, then I'll keep the rest of this work too. But I want these things gone. Sorry. If we restrict the domain to negative two comma two, okay, meaning that it's going to just be defined from this space right here, okay, and we wanna find the range, well, we can actually just figure out exactly which points to take. We know that we're gonna have a minimum at our vertex, right? And, and by the way, hopefully you haven't come this far in, the, in this problem and, and not realized what range was. Range is just the same thing as domain, but for Y values, okay? So it's the range of the Y values. It goes from like negative two to four, or maybe it goes from two to three, something like that. That's what the range is. So I apologize because I didn't clarify that in the, earlier in the problem, okay? But you know that you have a minimum Y value here, and you know that you're gonna have a positive Y value up here, okay? At X equals two, not at X equals negative two, okay? Generally, you would want to check both boundaries, but you know that this value is not going to be as high as this one. Okay, so that's what's really nice if you graph it out and think about it that way. So you know that you're going to have a minimum at your x equals negative one point. So if you plug that in, you can do, okay, you can say that h of, because this is h of x, okay, up here, and we know that h of x equals, and that's why I saved this, because I can plug that in right here, x squared plus 2x plus 2. And if you plug in negative 1, you get negative 1 squared plus 2 times negative 1 plus 2. You get h of negative 1 is equal to negative 1 squared is, two, is 1, uh, plus 2 times negative 1, that's a negative 2, and then you add 2. So you just get that this thing is equal to one, okay? And since this thing is just equal to one, well, that is our minimum for our range, okay? Next, we'll do our maximum value, which is at x equals two. So we plug in a two there, we get a two squared plus two times two plus two. So we get h of two is equal to two squared is four, two times two is four, and then we have a two. Four plus four plus two is 10. So then we have our maximum and minimum values, okay? And just to prove that h of negative two is not going to be a maximum value, okay? We can plug it in. We'll get negative two squared plus two times negative two plus two. And we end up getting negative two squared is four, plus two times negative two is negative four. And then we add two, and that gives us two, right? And two is in between one and 10. So it's not going to be a maximum or a minimum. So we can get rid of that. All right, so now we can state what our range is, okay? Our range is from, and we're going to include both endpoints here, right? because both endpoints are included in the domain. It's going to be from one to 10, okay? And that right there is our answer. Okay, so, you know, that was definitely one of the more complicated problems that's going to be, you know, out of this total 50 uh, problems, okay? So, you know, if you weren't able to stick with me, don't worry, you know, there you're probably not gonna get a problem that it was this involved on your actual test, okay? But I thought that it was really cool to kind of go through a couple of different things here and try to maybe help you develop some intuition for it, okay? So hopefully this problem ended up making sense. Hopefully I didn't go too fast, but, um, yeah, moving on to the next problem. For problem 14, and I will get rid of, actually, I'm not gonna get rid of the graph paper just yet because this problem could use it. This problem asks, is the relation shown below a function? 
explain why or why not. Okay, so we have just a set of points. Okay, now what makes a function? Well, something is a function if it passes the one of the main things about something being a function, right? It, it has to pass the horizontal line test, or sorry, not the horizontal line test, the vertical line test. Okay, a function. has to pass the vertical line test. Oh, ran out of room. See, here's the thing though, I don't have to erase it all or like right on the next line, I can just go like that. <laughs> okay, it has to pass the vertical line test and basically what that means is that for something like If you tried to do something that looks like this, some graph that looks like this, okay? This does not pass the vertical line test because you can draw a line straight down through it and it will touch the graph more than once. If it does, then it fails the vertical line test, okay? So what we want, so if this thing is a function, it needs to pass the vertical line test. Okay, so it needs to, for a single x value, there cannot be more than one y value, right? In this case, for this graph down here, there was, for one x value, we'll call this x equals three, right? There was two y values, okay? There was one at, let's, this was about 3.5, and down here was about negative three, right? So there's two y values for the same x value. Here, we can also see that's a problem for this set of coordinates up here because this x value, there's two, set, there's two ones right here and they both have different y values, okay? This also happens with the twos, right? You have two twos in the x and they both have different y values. So, this is not a function because it does not pass the vertical line test. And that's all you have to say for that problem. Okay, that's it. Okay, it doesn't, it doesn't pass, the, this relation is not a function, okay? And that's the idea. So, so this statement, by the way, is referring to the relation, not this thing. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. You just have to check, does it pass the vertical line test or not? And if it does pass the vertical line test, it's a function. If it doesn't, it's not. That's it, okay? So. Moving on to problem 15 and linear functions. Okay, we're moving on to our blue section here. We wanna find the equation of a line that passes through the points negative one half and three halves and five halves comma negative three halves. Okay, so there's a couple different things that we have to do to find the equation of a line. Okay, the first thing that we wanna do is find the slope. Okay, that's the first step is to find the slope. The second step is to find the y-intercept. And then the third step, is to just write the equation because this is the form we want to put it in. This is called slope intercept form. Okay, and that's the form that we want to put this line in. All right, that's kind of the easiest form to work with. I mean, there are other forms, uh, but I, I do like slope intercept form and it is used a lot. So maybe it's not the, maybe I misspoke. It's not necessarily the easiest formula, but it is the most widely used formula. Okay, so that's a better way of putting it. The slope here for step one, the slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. You've probably seen this before, right? It's equal to the change in y over the change in x. Okay? And so what does this subscript two, subscript one stuff mean? Well, basically you just have to pick some points. Let's say that this coordinates is going to correspond to one, whereas the negative one half is x one and the 
three halves is y1. Okay, and then let's say five halves is x2 and negative three halves is y2. Okay, so now we just plug in y2 is negative three halves and y1 is three halves. So we sub and we're subtracting that, right? Then we have x2 minus x1 on the bottom. x2 is five halves and x1 is negative one half. So we have a minus negative one half. Okay, negative three halves minus negative three, or sorry, it's negative three halves minus three halves is going to be negative six over two. And you can simplify that, right? That's just literally just negative six divided by two. And you know, that's negative three. Okay, so this actually, this becomes negative three on top. Okay, on the bottom, we have five halves minus a negative one half. Okay, you have two negatives, you can make them both positive, and you have six over two. Six over two is three. Okay, and negative three over three is negative one. So you have your slope. Okay. And by the way, I am erasing my work right now just to make room uh, for, for everything to kind of make it really concise, but that's not something you want to do on your test. So I don't, I'm hoping I'm not rubbing you the wrong way by uh, doing all that erasing. Okay. So yeah, don't do that on your actual test because you don't want to get points off. Um, especially because you watch some guy on YouTube do it. <laughs> all right. But anyways, so how do you find the y intercept? Well, what you want to do now is you actually want to plug into slope intercept form with one of your points. Okay, because you have y, m and x. If you plug in one of the points, you have x and y and you already have your slope, but you don't have your y intercept. So if you plug in these three things, then the only thing that's left unknown is your b. And so you can solve for that. Okay, so let's plug in. Let's choose this pair of coordinates, okay? So we'll choose X, we'll choose our first pair, x1 and y1, and we'll plug in. So if we're plugging into y equals mx plus b, remember y is three halves, we have our slope is negative one, our x is negative one halves, our b is what we don't know and what we're trying to solve for, okay? So we're just going to simplify here. We get three halves is equal to negative one times a half is one half, and we add b. So just to get b by itself, we're gonna subtract one halves on both sides, and three halves minus a half is just going to be two halves, which is one. So b equals one, okay? Since b equals one and the slope equals negative one, we have everything that we need to write this in step three in slope intercept form. Okay, this is just going to be y equals, we have our slope, we plug in our slope and we plug in our y-intercept, our slope is negative one, so this is negative one times x, and then we have plus one. Now you can write this a little more compactly, getting rid of the parentheses and getting rid of the one, and just writing it as negative x plus one. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense, right? Again, just finding the slope, Finding the y-intercept, plugging in. So for problem 16, we want to write and graph an equation which converts a length measured in feet to that length measured in yards, okay? And so we have the conversion here to that three feet equals one yard, okay? So this is actually a really interesting problem. It has a great way of combining unit conversions and a linear equation. Okay, because that's what unit conversions are. They're a one-to-one -one comparison, right? So every three feet that you travel is one yard, right? And that that proportion between them, right, ends up forming uh, the slope of your line. Okay, so it's actually really interesting. So let's start out by writing some let statements. Let's let x equal one foot. And let's let y equal one yard. If we rewrite this conversion in terms of x and y, we get that three x, right, three feet equals one yard. Why? We can switch that around and make it a little more familiar to you. Y equals three x 
and that's a line, right? So there you go. There's your equation for the line. Okay, oops. Where's my, there we go. Okay, so this is your equation. So you circled that, that's part of your answer. Now we wanna graph it. So we're just graphing y equals three x at this point, okay? And if you're, if you're getting a little confused right now, literally all we did was make a let statement. And using that, now we could describe three feet in terms of x and one yard in terms of y, and we have our equation, okay? Plotting our axes, okay? We now have x-axis, y-axis, and 3x, right? That just starts at zero. All right, see if you can, you, I mean, you can plot this with an xy table if you, you can use that if you want. Um, you can do it in other ways too, right? Remember your slope is your rise over run, right? So you could literally graph this by starting since you know that your y-intercept is zero, right? This is the same thing as saying 3x plus zero, right? So you know that your y-intercept is that, you can literally just go up one, two, three, and over one, and then down one, two, three, and over one, okay? And then you can connect those points. Okay, and actually, I guess, if I wanna do that, I gotta start like that, nice. Okay, well, there you go, there's your line. Okay, and you wanna label it, make sure you label your line, y equals three x, okay? And there you go, that's your answer. Okay, so, but let me show you that also with an x, y table. You could have just easily done that, right? Let's say this is one, this is negative one. You don't need many points to graph a line, right? You actually only need two, but I used three. Okay, just making making the chart here. Okay, this is x, this is y, negative one, zero, and one. Okay, using the equation y equals three x, when x is negative one, y is gonna be negative three. When x is zero, y is gonna be zero. When x is one, y is gonna be three. And that's exactly what we have here, okay? So you can do it either way. Moving on, really interesting problem here. Using dimensional analysis, and by the way, this is going to be a calculator problem. Uh, using dimensional analysis, find the number of seconds in a decade, okay? And I have excluded leap years here because that's just gonna make it really complicated. Okay, so remember what I said in the beginning of the video. Uh, dimensional analysis, same thing as unit conversion. Okay, that's a really, it's a, just a really fancy term for it. I, and it, like I said, I didn't know what dimensional analysis was. Like I knew what unit conversion was, but I didn't, I didn't know what dimensional analysis was, you know, this really pretentious term until I was a freshman in college. So, you know, don't feel bad if you have no idea what that is still. Um, anyways, so all we have to do here, okay, we're starting out with one decade and we want to get to some number of seconds right so let's start off we have one decade and we're going to work our way to seconds how we're going to do that well let's start off with years right we know that one decade is 10 years hopefully you know that <laughs> if you didn't know that that would be hard to to work with right we know that there's 10 years in a decade and that's how we're going to write it because what happens here is if you just think of this as like one decade over one, right? Units cancel, right? So one decade over one decade is literally just one, right? So you get that this thing is equal to 10 years, okay? And if you re if you see what you've, you've done here, really you've just said that, okay, well one decade equals 10 years and 
Okay, so in the end you get one decade. You use your conversion factor, you get one decade is equal to 10 years. Okay, but that's not all we're doing here. But I just, I just wanted to get you, I wanted to help you understand how we're setting this thing up. Okay, because now we have to convert years to, don't convert to months or don't, you know, don't convert to, to weeks either. Okay, just convert to how many days are in a year. That's the best bet. Okay, I've, I've definitely tripped up on that before myself. Just tried to like, okay, how many days are in a week and how many weeks are in a year? Don't do that because it's not exact. Okay, but it will give you a rough estimate. There are 365 days in a year. Okay, and now we're just gonna get years to cancel off. There are, then we can do uh, how many hours are in a day? 24 hours in a day. Okay, then we can do how many minutes are in an hour? So we have 60 minutes in an hour. Then we can do how many seconds, lastly, we could do how many seconds are in a minute. And to do that, I am running out of room, so I need to crunch down. We can write that there are 60 seconds in one minute, okay? And all these parentheses are multiplication. So what we're gonna be doing now is just multiplying all these fractions together. It's actually gonna be really easy because all these denominators are one, okay? And so we're just gonna multiply all the numerators together and call it good. But I want you to really understand what's going on here. The reason why we're writing it like this is because now when you multiply, all the units cancel out except for seconds, right? You get one decade and you're using conversions. Okay, days cancel out, hours cancel, minutes cancel. And the only unit that does not cancel is seconds. So you get a value of seconds, okay? But what did you start out with? You started out with one decade. So in the end, you're gonna get whatever one decade equals. Okay, so hopefully this isn't too confusing. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna, you know, you can plug this in your calculator. You have one times 10 times 365 times 24 times 60 times 60. And what you end up getting is 315 million, 360,000 seconds, okay? And if you know scientific notation, you can write it in scientific notation, okay? If you don't know scientific notation, don't worry about what I'm about to do here, but this can just be represented as 3.15 times 10 to the nine seconds, okay? So that is it. Okay, so just some dimensional analysis. Moving on to problem 18, we wanna write the equation for a line that is perpendicular to y equals two x plus one, and that passes through the point zero two, okay? So there's a couple different things to key in on here. First, perpendicular, and second, we have a point, okay? Well, and when we're, of course we're given an equation for the line that it's perpendicular to, so let's take care of the perpendicular case first. Right? So we want to find the equation of a line that's perpendicular to another line. Okay? So what do we know about perpendicular? What does that mean for lines? Okay? Well, you have to, hopefully, what's popping in your head, okay? If you, if you uh, have any ideas of negative reciprocals, that's right. Okay? That's exactly what you do to a function that's perpendicular. Now, if you don't know, what that is, don't worry about it because we're just about to do it right now. Whenever you have a, if you're, you're, you're talking about some, some line being perpendicular to another line, all you do to find the slope of that line, because that's all that's changing if something's perpendicular, you can change the slope, right? The slope is two here. And you take the negative reciprocal of it, right? You take the negative reciprocal. Okay, and the negative reciprocal of two is just exactly what it says, right? You take the negative first, so you transform two to negative two, and then you take the reciprocal, meaning you just flip it, okay? 
So you make two, you keep the negative, and then you just have one over two, right? Instead of, because two is two over one, you make it one over two. All right, so you flip it. So your slope of a line that is perpendicular to this line is negative one half, okay? Now the y-intercept actually doesn't matter for this line because it'll still be perpendicular no matter what, right? So you could just have negative one half times x and that still will be a line that's perpendicular to this line, okay? It'll just be, it's kind of like you have your your regular line right here, okay? And then you have another line that's perpendicular. Okay, let's see if I can draw a line that's perpendicular. Right, all right, right about there. So basically what I'm saying is that you can move anywhere you want. You can have whatever y-intercept you want. You can notice that my y-intercept is moving, right? It's moving up and down the y-axis but the line is still perpendicular, so it doesn't matter what the y-intercept actually is, okay? But in this case, it does because we're given a point that it has to pass through. Well, what do we do before when we had a point that it passed through, right? We had to find the y-intercept and then we plugged into our slope-intercept form. So that's exactly what we're gonna do here. Okay, we're gonna plug in the point that we're given zero to. Okay, and we'll find what B is. Zero, two, so that means we're plugging in a zero for X and a two for Y. So we get two equals negative one half times zero plus B, and since this goes away, we just get the B equals two. All right, and so, sorry, that shouldn't be circled in blue because it's not our final answer. So we, our final answer is Y equals negative one half x plus 2. That will be circled in blue because that is our final answer. Okay, So we've done actually a few pretty complicated problems and I think that's a great place to just take a break for you know for five minutes or something. Get, get a quick breather and then we have another seven problems and then we're done with part one okay and that's uh you know we are going to be doing exponential functions and then sequences okay so uh it won't be it won't be terrible i'll make these seven problems go uh, pretty quickly and of course you'll be able to check by the timestamps in the video and and how much time is left so hopefully i actually uh kept with that promise anyways assuming that you've taken your five minute break let's hop back down into this problem Problem 19 on exponential functions. We want to simplify the following exponential expression. We have 5x squared, y to the negative 4, that's all being squared, and that's over 10x to the negative 1, y squared. Okay, so we want to simplify this. Now, there's a couple different things to note that's going on here. First, we have, ex we have exponents that are negative, so we need to figure out how to deal with that. And then we also have this 2 in the exponent, that is an exponent of this whole entire thing. So what does that do? What does that mean? We have to figure that out. So first off, what does a negative exponent do? Well, if we have something like y to the negative four, right, which is what we have over there, that basically means we have one over y to the fourth. Okay, that's what a negative exponent does. It just flips the entire thing, and that's how you can make the exponent positive. Okay, so two to the negative one is something we had earlier. That's just one over two to the first power, which is one half. Okay, whereas if you had something like two to the negative two, it's one over two squared, and that's one over four. Okay, so that's that. Now, that's what a negative exponent does. What does this do? <laughs> so this square, what is that going to do for us here? Well, all that does, when you have a exponent to an exponent, right, which is what we're actually gonna have here, you just multiply them. Okay, so how you can think about this, and let me put this in perspective here. If you have something like 5x plus y, and this whole thing is being squared, you cannot distribute this exponent here and here, right? What this would mean is that you have two iterations of 5x plus y being multiplied together. That's what this is equal to, okay? Not, not 5x plus y 
with each of these being squared. That's not what this is equal to. In this case though, since we only have one term, right? Remember what a term is, right? This, these, this is two terms because the addition signs uh, and, the, and subtraction signs, they separate different terms, okay? We can actually just distribute this exponent here. Okay, these are all being multiplied together. Okay, so this whole entire thing is being squared. Okay, so you can't do that when you have multiple terms, but when you have a single term, yes, you can do that. Okay, so this thing is gonna be equal to, if we put that square out, we have five squared times x squared squared times y to the negative four squared. And that's over 10 x to the negative one y squared. If we just, since we have an exponent to an exponent here, then we just multiply them and we have the same thing here, we multiply them. So we get a five squared, which we can actually rewrite as 25, and then we have x to the fourth, y to the negative eighth. We put that over 10x to the negative one y squared. Okay, now let's just flip our negative exponents, right? Let's just put this here and then let's put this here. So what we end up with is 25 over 10, which we can actually just simplify to five over two. And then we have a x to the fourth times x to the first power times y to the, and then we have over two y to the eight, y squared, okay? So we just put the, we just flipped the negative exponents and made them positive. And if we simplify this, because we have a, you know, x to the fourth times x to the first. And when we have two exponents um, with the same base, right, we have x to the fourth times x to the first, that's just gonna be these two exponents added together, right? So it's going to be x to the fifth. The same thing on the bottom. So when we have y to the eighth times y to the second power, we get y to the eight plus two, which is equal to y to the tenth. Okay, so we'll have an x to the fifth and a y to the tenth. All right, so five x to the fifth to y to the tenth. All right, and that is going to be our answer. So moving on to problem 20, okay? We have a actually really interesting question here. If you fold a one millimeter thick piece of paper 15 times, what is the resulting width in meters, okay? So you know the, the whole thing about you, you can't fold a piece of paper like over seven times or something like that, right? Well, now we're trying to say, oh, what if we could? What if we could actually fold it up to 15 times? And let's say, you know, it's only like one millimeter thick, okay? Well, what would its resulting width be? How wide would this piece of paper actually be? And the actual answer here is actually gonna be really cool. Really, really mind blowing too, okay? So here, you have to understand something about a fold, okay? And this is why it's in the exponential section, okay? If you fold a piece of paper over, okay? If I have two, if I have some sheet of paper and I'm trying to draw like a piece of paper being folded, but it's not, I'm not doing a very good job. <laughs> Anyways, I have one side here and another side here. Okay, and this is the same sheet of paper but I'm just folding it over together. Okay, the resulting width of this thing, see we get a side view here. Okay, whatever, it's not gonna work with me right now, but the, the resulting width of this thing is going to be twice what it was before, okay? So each fold, and if you fold it again, it's now going to be four times as long, and each time that you fold it, you're going to be increasing the width by a factor of two. And that can be described by an exponential function, okay? And well, what's an exponential function? It takes on the form y equals a times b to the x, okay? A is your starting point. And b is your rate of increase or decrease. Okay? And actually, a is also your y-intercept, 
because it's where you start and it's where your if you know remember the y intercept is on the line x equals zero so you plug in x equals zero for this you get y equals a times b to the zero anything to the zero power is one so this actually just equals a right this just this whole thing is just one so it equals a and so a is your y intercept okay so let's make an exponential function here well, what's our starting point well we're starting at one millimeter when we have zero folds we start at one millimeter so let's just write this and since we want this in meters I'm just going to convert one millimeter to meters we know that one millimeter is 0 0.001 meters okay that's something you should know right and and, and, and then we have our rate of increase and decrease. We know that each time that we fold this piece of paper, it gets its width multiplied by two. So it's 0 0.001 times two to the X. That's our function, okay? And we want it to be folded 15 times, okay? So X is just gonna be 15 here and we're gonna plug in. So, if you plug this into your calculator here, you get 32.8 meters. So if you fold this little one millimeter thick piece of paper, which, you know, is, is a little, I think a little more wide than your average sheet of paper, right? But it's still about the same size, right? If you folded that 15 times, it would be 32 0.8 meters long or, or wide rather so it definitely goes to show you how how mind-boggling you know exponential growth can be right it's, it's really cool anyways moving on to problem 21 okay we want to state the y-intercept of the following graph and we want to tell if the graph represents exponential growth or exponential decay this problem is actually really straightforward remember I said the y-intercept is a right and B is the rate of of increase or decrease right so we have all the the stuff that we need to solve this problem in just this equation first the y-intercept is 3 right so we can write that down and we can verify that okay let's say that remember the y-intercept occurs at x equals 0 right let's think about that in a graph, right? Your y-intercept is gonna occur on this line. This line is x equals zero, right? So if we set x equal to zero, then we get y equals three. Okay, so that's our y-intercept. Now our graph is gonna represent exponential decay because our rate of increase in, or, or slash decrease is, is, is a decrease, right? Because it's less than one. So what's happening is each for each value of X, right? We're multiplying by a value less than one, which means our value is getting smaller. Think about 10 times one tenth, you know, 10 times 0.1. You're going to make 10, you're gonna turn that into one, right? So it's, it's becoming smaller, so it's decreasing, okay? So this is actually going to be exponential decay okay so you can say exponential decay because B which is equal to one-third is less than one okay all right so moving on to problem 22, I was actually really proud that I made this problem and I should have made pro more problems like this in this video. So I apologize for that. But uh, the amount of subscribers that I have compounds monthly and can be modeled by the function uh, S of T where S is my subscribers and T is time. Uh, S of T equals 500 times 1.25 to the T power. If T is equal to zero right now on June 1st, 2019, uh, I'm probably not going to be, I'll, I'll release this video before June 1st, but, um, cause like right now I think it's like May, I actually don't know what, what day it is right now. I think it's like May 17th or something, but, 
I could be way off. <laughs> Anyways, uh, let's just say it's June 1st, okay? June 1st, 2019. How many subscribers will I have by the end of 2019? Okay, and how many will I have by the end of 2020? And also, how many subscribers do I currently have? Okay, I'll start underlining this information. How many subscribers do I currently have? And what is the percent increase of the subscribers each month? Okay, so there's four questions that we're answering here. Okay, and I'll actually label these A, I'll label this one A, B, and then I'll label these C and D because they're a little more involved. Okay, if we're answering A, right, how many subscribers do I currently have? That's equivalent to the Y intercept, right? It's where we're starting from. We're starting from 500 subscribers right, which is about what I have now. I just passed 500 about a couple days ago. I think two or three days ago. Okay, so that's where we're starting from. Right, and that should make sense from the last couple problems that we did. Now, percent increase. We are compounding, we're multiplying by 1.25. Okay, we're multiplying by 1.25 each month. Okay, so what's 1.25? in percent. Well, 1.25 converted to percent is 125%. And percent increase means, okay, well, how many percent above 100? Right? If it was 100%, if I had, if I retained 100% of my subscribers every month, that's no increase at all. Right? So, what we do is we just subtract 100. How many percent above 100 are you? And that's your percent increase right? And that's 25%. So it's 25% increase monthly. So let's say that this YouTube channel is able to do well enough. And by the way, this is, this problem is definitely a shameless plug to subscribe to the channel. But let's say, you know, I, I have 500 subscribers right now. Okay. Which is true. I have basically been, you know, increasing by about 25% uh, of, of subscriber growth each month. Let's see what I'm going to be at by the end of the year and let's see what I'm going to be at by the end of next year. Okay, so let's try it. To do problem C and D, we need an actual equation, but luckily we have one. Okay, so all we're going to do is plug in values of T. Well, we got to figure out what T is going to be for the end of 2019. Okay, well, this might be, you know, T is not going to be six here. Okay. I'm going to put that out there right now. T is not going to be six. And I actually writing this problem thought that at first, but then I realized, okay, no, it's actually not going to be because it's June 1st right now. That means we still have to go through all of June and then we have to go through all of July and all of August. And I'll count on my fingers here, all of August, all of September, all of October, all of November and all of December. So that's seven months. Okay. So T is going to equal seven. Okay, so let's see how many subscribers I have when t equals 7, aka when uh, it's at the end of 2019, the end of this year. What am I going to be at? Okay, so t equals 7. Let's plug that in. We have that s of t equals 500 times 1.25 to the seventh power. Okay, so when we actually multiply this out, um, and actually I'll just write the answer here, this is going to be equal to 2,384 subscribers. Okay, so I'll definitely have hit 1k, which is nice. I actually believe that with this model, I'd hit 1k. And these are the kind of models that I do in my free time, by the way, just because I've, you know, I get interested at what sub, what kind of subs am I going to be at with what different percentages of growth. So it's actually kind of something cool that I do in my free time. But yeah, I mean, you know, 20 or 2000 subscribers by the end of the year, that's, that's all right, you know, but then let's see what I would be at at the end of 2020. At the end of 2020, and so you just multiply T by, or not multiply, you add 12 to it, right? Because 12 more months. You get S of T, 500 times 1.25 to the 19th power. And when you put that in your calculator, you get 
694 subscribers. Okay? And to be completely honest and transparent here, well, like 35,000 subscribers would be really, really nice and would be a huge step up from the 500 that I'm at now. Honestly, by the end of 2020, I really hope that I was at like above 100,000 subscribers. Uh, so, so, or else then I've, I'm doing something wrong if I'm not there. Um, and I hope that by the end of 2019, I'm at higher than, than 2,384, but you know, we'll see, we'll see what happens. All right. Anyways, we're talking about your final right now. So let's get back to that. Okay. We got to get you prepped for this. So for sequences, our last topic, we have three more problems and then we're done. Given the following sequence, a sub n equals a sub n minus one plus three, where a sub one equals negative two, find a sub two, a sub three, and a sub four, and also state what kind of sequence this is and what kind of formula you've been given. Okay, so you have another, there's actually a five part problem. We gotta find a sub two, a sub three, a sub four. We have to state what kind of sequence this is and we have to also state what kind of formula we've been given. Okay, so let's call this A, call this B, call this C, D, and E. Okay, because that's the order in which I wanna actually do this problem. Okay, what kind of sequence is this? Well, the idea is that all we're doing from, this is going to be your previous term, right? A sub N minus one, and this is the term you're trying to find. Okay, so all that's different is that you're adding some value to it. Okay, you're adding some value or you're subtracting some value. If you're doing either of those things, it's an arithmetic sequence. Okay, it's an arithmetic sequence. And if you're multiplying or dividing, it's a geometric sequence. Okay, but here since we're adding, we have a arithmetic sequence. So we call this an arithmetic sequence. Okay, so moving on to part B, what kind of formula is this? Well, since we always are dealing with our previous term here and I'll get into what this a sub n minus one is, so don't, don't worry about it. Okay, well, what this kind of formula is called a recursive formula. Okay, so those are just some things to know. This thing is called a recursive formula. Okay, but then let's move on to actually finding this. Let's let's use an actually, let's let's find what a sub two is. Let's use this formula a little bit. Okay, if we bring down this formula, we get well. Let's set n equal to two here. Okay, that's what finding a sub two means. Okay, we're gonna consider when n equals two. Because if n equals two, then we have a sub two equals a sub two minus one plus three. Okay, and well, two minus one is one. So we have a sub two equals a plus a sub one plus three. And a sub one is negative two. So we know that a sub two equals negative two plus three. And that's equal to one, okay? So that's, you know, don't get confused when you see the n minus one there. Really, you know, you wanna find a sub two? Okay, set n equal to two, right? That gives you a subscript two, okay? And so all you have to do to find that is just plug in your a sub one, right? Which is a sub n minus one, AKA a sub two minus one, which is a sub one, all right? So there you go, that's C. So part D now, we want to find a sub three. That's going to be equal to a sub two plus three, right? Because you just set n equal to three now. And now you have a sub three equals a sub three minus one plus three, which three minus one is two. Okay. And a sub two we just found is one. So one plus three is four. And moving on to our last part here, part E, we want to find a sub four. And that's equal to then a sub three plus three. And that's four plus three, which is seven. Okay, and here you can see more of the, the arithmetic sequence. If I write terms out here, you started out with negative two, 
and then you're going to one, four, and seven, and you can see these are all separated by three. Okay, this so that's an arithmetic sequence. Okay, and again, when we're given the previous term like that, when you see things like a sub n minus one, you're you're talking about a recursive formula. Okay, it uses the terms from before to find the current term. Now, for problem 24, we want to write the exponential equation given in problem 22 as a geometric sequence. Okay, I couldn't, I had to bring up the subscriber problem again, but we want to write it as a geometric sequence where n is equal to zero, uh, where n equals zero is June 1st, uh, 2019. I think I should have crossed that out, right? Where n equals zero is June 1st, 2019. Good. Yeah. Graph this sequence from n equals 0 to n equals 4. So this is actually a really interesting problem. So remember the formula from before. I'll bring it down. Okay. So this was the formula from before. We can actually convert this to a geometric sequence. Because really, what's happening each time is that you are basically you know, like let's say this is for the uh, beginning of June, so like the end of May, you could say that this number is for. The end of June, this is going to be multiplied by 1.25, right? So it'll be 625, and that will correspond to t equals one. All right, this will be from t equals zero, and then you can keep going. And actually, if you keep going, and you can just multiply, keep multiplying by 1.25 here, you'll get 720, or sorry, 700, 81, 977, and 1,221. And those all correspond to t equals 2, t equals 3, and t equals 4. Right? So this will be our, my subscriber count at different months. And according to this model, this is the end of June, this is the end of July, this is the end of August, this is the end of September. Somewhere in between August and September, I'll hit 1,000 subscribers. Okay? So here's the deal. Let's, since with sequences we use n, let's set each of these equal to n. So this is n equals one, n equals zero, n equals two, n equals three, and n equals four. Okay? And so, so we'll get rid of that. Okay? And what we're gonna do now is we're just going to write this as a geometric sequence. So we're just going to write, okay, s sub n, Okay, that, so instead of writing it as like a function, the n just goes in the subscript. Okay, s sub n equals 500 times 1.25 to the nth power. Okay, this is geometric form, right? You got that, that a sub r to the n minus, uh, well, it could be n minus one, you could have like r to the n, right? So it's the same idea. All right, so you have your geometric form. Okay, so, now, what happens here is that we can graph this pretty easily. I'll write my axes here. And actually, since we're only dealing with positives, I'll just write it like that, okay? Now, the thing to know about sequences, there's no like, half integer values or anything like that. So you don't, you're not dealing with like anything between the numbers. So we're going to have points on this graph that are going to represent what it is at n equals zero, one, two, three, but they're not going to be connected. Okay. Cause that's not what a sequence does. A sequence is just, you know, it, it's, there's no intermediate terms. Okay. You can't just go, okay, well, what about when n equals one half? No, n equals zero, one, two, three, four. It equals the counting numbers. It doesn't equal um, any any like halves or fractions or anything like that Okay Unless you say it does which we with sequences don't do that. So don't even think about that <laughs> All right, so let's call this 500 and let's just say that this is 600 This is 700 and then we'll go up through and name these different Okay, if you actually were given a problem like this about, you know, because you, of course, would be given a problem about my subscriber growth. But, you know, you could be given a problem that's similar to this. Um, you know, you would be given a, a graph like this anyway. So you wouldn't have to do this. But at n equals zero, so we'll actually call this zero, we'll call this 
one, two, three, and four. Okay, and so I'll plot these points with pink. We have at zero, it's 500. At one, it's 625. At two, it's 781. At three, it's 977. At four, it's 1,221. Oops. Okay, and so you can see the, the exponential curve here. Right? You can see if we were to connect these dots, how it would look. Right? It's exponential growth. So, you know, hopefully, you know, like the next few months, I'd be going way up like this. Right? That's the, that's the trend that it'd be on. But of course, for sequences, right, you do not connect this because, like I said, this is, there's no n equals one half. Right? That's not how that works. Okay? That works that way for functions, but it does not work that way for sequences. Okay, so that's where you leave that graph. So you have this, and you have this, and that is your answer. Lastly, we're going to uh, end on another sequence problem. We have this question here, is the following sequence an arithmetic sequence or is it a geometric sequence? Okay, if it's arithmetic, find the common difference. If it's geometric, find the common ratio. And also fill in the next two terms. So this sequence right here we can tell that this you know then like the difference here if you try to get from 8 to negative 4 you would have to subtract 12 right and if you subtract 12 here you do not get 2 you get negative 16 so we definitely know that this is not an arithmetic sequence okay so we can just cross that right out it's not an arithmetic sequence and we don't have to find the common difference which is just d right so uh, you, you know, if you have the recursive formula for a, a uh, arithmetic sequence, this is the common difference, right? And I'll show you an example of that in the first sequence problem we did. The common difference was three. Okay. So anyways. We can see here that if we multi if we try to get from eight to negative four by multiplying or dividing, if we just multiply by a negative one half, we will get to negative four. If we multiply by negative one half again, we will get to two. So this is actually a geometric sequence, and the common ratio is negative one half. Okay, because if you multiply by negative one half, you'll also get from negative four to two. Okay, and so there you go, that's your common ratio. And that's also marked as R, so we write that as R. Okay, and then we have, of course, this is a geometric sequence. And we can fill in the next two terms by just multiplying by negative one half again. If you multiply two by negative one half, you get negative one. Multiply negative one by negative a half and you get one half. Okay, so that is everything. Okay, so oh, that is going to do it for our first 25 problems. Okay, so that was definitely uh, just a lot and um, I definitely ran a lot longer than I thought I was going to, but hopefully that extra time that I used to better explain the topics actually resulted in the topics getting better explained. I really hope that this video was able to help you. And uh, if you have any questions, of course, leave them down in the comments below. Uh, of course, subscribe so I can help you uh, with your, your courses in the future as well. And subscribing helps you find the part two video. Anyways, um, thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.